Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friend. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast, where we're discussing expert opinions and innovations on how to target central sensitization through using nutrition and diet and other lifestyle factors. This is a special episode where you can listen, learn, and earn continuing education credit. Today's episode is sponsored by the Integrated Pain Science Institute. The Institute is approved for continuing education for physical therapists. It is also approved for or meets the standards for the National Board for Certification in Occupational Therapy. The Integrated Pain Science Institute is approved by the American Psychological Association to sponsor continuing education credits for psychologists and other mental health providers. And then finally, the Institute is recognized by the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching as an approved continuing education provider. Once you listen to this week's episode and you want to rack up some extra continuing education units, all you have to do is go to the Integrated Pain Science Institute.com, go to the courses tab, and then scroll down to where it says listen and learn and click register to register for episode number 200. Today's episode is available for two credit hours. Our objectives today is to describe how poor nutrition upregulates brain glial cell activation and contributes to central sensitization. You'll be able to identify dietary patterns associated with central nervous system sensitization and chronic pain. And finally, to explain three ways optimizing nutrition impacts pain and central sensitization. Now, we've used the word central sensitization probably already about 10 times today. So I think it's really important that we just kind of review the definition or the working definition that we're using for today's episode and that you use as you go into that CEU proof course. So with regard to central nervous system sensitization, the definition we're following is an amplification of neuronal signaling within the central nervous system that elicits pain hypersensitivity. That's a mouthful. I'll say it one more time. An amplification of neuronal signaling within the central nervous system that elicits pain hypersensitivity. Now each day the latest pain science explores deeper into exactly what central nervous system sensitization is, what type of conditions this is present in, and of course how to effectively prevent or treat it. Chances are if you're seeing people with chronic low back pain, lumbar radiculopathy, fibromyalgia, migraine type headaches, pediatric pain, and I'm going to put a little star there next to mood disorders. Various mood disorders, especially depression, are all associated with signs of central nervous system sensitization. So the research points to central nervous system sensitization being a well-established feature in many patients that we're seeing in the clinic setting today, especially, of course, those with chronic pain. Over the last couple of years, there have been more and more research papers coming out with regard to how nutrition impacts chronic non-cancer pain. We've had everything from cohort studies to randomized control trials to meta-analyses. There are two meta-analyses that were completed within the last couple of years. The first one was from the Journal of Human Nutrition and Diet in 2019, and it looked at a systematic review and meta-analysis of nutrition interventions for chronic non-cancer pain. And then the second one was in the Journal of Clinical Medicine 2020, which asked the question, do nutritional factors interact with chronic musculoskeletal pain, a systematic review. Now, the overarching themes based on these two different meta-analyses and systematic reviews that's available in the literature currently is that an altered dietary pattern and altered specific nutrient intake may have analgesic properties for some patients living with chronic pain. That's the highest level of evidence. That's level evidence 1A. We'll talk about that later. And further systematic reviews have associated or linked, have a link between nutritional factors and chronic musculoskeletal pain, specifically how plant-based diets have analgesic properties for chronic musculoskeletal pain. Again, really high level of evidence there, level of evidence 1A, which we're going to discuss in a moment. And I encourage you to find those papers. Most of them are available publicly through PubMed, where you can read the information about how nutrition impacts chronic pain. But on today's episode, I want to focus all of our attention in on a paper that was published in June of 2020. The title of the paper is Nutritional Intervention in Chronic Pain, 
an innovative way of targeting central nervous system sensitization. You can find this paper in the Journal of Expert Opinion on Therapeutic Targets. The lead researcher on this paper was Joe Nace. He is a uh, physiotherapist and a researcher. He's probably uh, the top five pain or chronic pain researchers in the world. He's also probably the number one or two researchers with regard to central nervous system sensitization. There were probably about 12 authors who contributed to this paper. I was one of them. It was great to uh, work with all these minds. Uh, really kind of an interdisciplinary approach to looking at how nutrition, central sensitization, neuroinflammation all contribute to chronic pain. So this is the focus of our uh, talk today. Of, uh, and of course, the focus of this CEU activity today. And I'll give you a way to access the paper later on. And I'll just share the methods with you with regard to this paper. As I mentioned before, there's already been two meta-analyses on the impact of nutrition and chronic pain. We probably could have did a third one. There's room for more meta-analyses. And if you're a researcher, I uh, encourage you to look at the data and see um, where the holes are with regard to uh, collating that research and creating another meta-analysis. But we decided to take an umbrella approach where we looked at many different types of evidence, reviewed that evidence, and then of course, based on all the different types of experts on the paper, provide an expert opinion. But it wasn't just our personal opinion. This opinion used a grading system from the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine. That grading system goes from 1A to number five, and kind of 1A at the top are systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. And then as you move down from 1A all the way down to five, you go through randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, individual case controls, case series. And then finally, number five is expert opinion with or without a critical appraisal of literature based on physiology. So for example, um, the, the physiology or the neurophysiology of how nutrition impacts pain. So these are the methods that were used in this uh, paper. It's an umbrella approach based on review and expert opinion from experts in the field of nutrition, central sensitization, and of course, chronic pain. So when we're talking about central sensitization and nutrition, we're really talking about the neuroimmune mechanisms that link diet to central nervous system sensitization. And there are really three key neuroimmune mechanisms with regard to central, central sensitization. The first one is an increase in microglia or, or just simply glial cell activity in the brain. With that, there's an increase in neurotrophic factors. So for example, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The second is the increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Probably the most common one that you'll see in the literature is tumor necrosis factor alpha and how it can potentiate basically those two, the neurotrophic factors and the pro-inflammatory cytokines can enhance or potentiate increased synaptic activity. And that's what ultimately leads to pain and central nervous system sensitization. So this slide right here is probably the key slide of the entire presentation. And if you're listening to this in the car, or maybe you're running on the treadmill or exercising as you listen to this podcast, just know that you can hop on over to the blog at the integrated pain science institute.com. And you can see the entire slide presentation of what I'm discussing. So you can see this key slide that really looks at the neuroimmune mechanisms that link dietary patterns to central sensitization and activation of glia in the central nervous system. So let's kind of go through this kind of piece by piece, one by one, I'll walk you through this. So there's a lot on this slide. I'm gonna start in kind of the centerpiece there where they're talking about poor nutrition. So in general, when you look at um, nutrition research, and when they mention the term poor nutrition, you're looking at a standard Western diet that is high in saturated fat, specifically um, seed oils that are processed, high in carbohydrates, especially highly processed carbohydrate foods, and then just an overall energy dense diet. So for example, high calories, high energy. So that's the, the model or the framework of poor nutrition. With that, if you kind of follow that down the center of the slide there, poor nutrition leads to oxidative stress, necrotic cells or tissue damage. So poor nutrition can actually damage cell or kill cells. And when that happens, it can activate toll-like receptors. So what are toll-like receptors? So on the surface of every cell, we have receptors. Specifically, these toll-like receptors can be found on immune cells, both the innate and the adaptive immune cells. And poor nutrition can activate those toll-like receptors. And when that happens, Proteins are produced by those immune cells, and those proteins activate the glial cells in the central nervous system, 
and that's what leads to central nervous system sensitization. So that's just one um, kind of funnel there you can follow. The second is that same dietary pattern, high saturated fat, high carbohydrate, nutrient poor, energy dense diet can lead to activation of the vagus nerve in your gut. With the activation of the vagus nerve, that vagus nerve runs from the, many of the organs in your gut, specifically the stomach and the small intestine, runs up into the brain. And just specifically, you can have inflammation run along the vagus nerve that activates those vagus afferents. And then finally runs up into the brain, which again, activates glial cells in the central nervous system. And then finally leads to central nervous system sensitization. Okay, but there's more to the picture. Poor nutrition also changes the gut microbiome. With changes in the gut microbiome, you can have inflammation both inside the gut, so inside, let's say, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. You can also have peripheral inflammation, so inflammation that's traveling, let's say, in the periphery, in your bloodstream, as well as interstitial fluid. That can activate the vagus nerve, but that peripheral inflammation can also travel through the bloodstream. It can pass through the blood-brain barrier. It can also pass through the spinal cord barrier. And with that, it can activate glial cells in the central nervous system, and then finally cause central nervous system sensitization. So basically, those are the three ways where poor diet can cause this activation of glial, glial cells. But if you're looking at this slide, if you look over to the right-hand side, you'll see not only poor nutrition, but you also see three other important factors. Opioids, poor sleep, and stress. So I'll say that one more time. Along with nutrition, opioids, poor sleep, and stress can directly impact those toll-like receptors in the immune system. And it can also directly impact through the blood-brain barrier, activation of glial cells, which in turn causes that wind-up or that central nervous system sensitization to happen. So really important key slide here. That's why we look at an integrated approach where we're combining changes in someone's diet and nutrition, along with changes in sleep patterns and stress. And of course, hopefully moving people away or starting to taper them down off of opioids, because opioids, in effect, can lead to opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is caused by central nervous system sensitization. So probably the key question with regard to everything we're speaking about today is, can nutrition be used to modulate these neuroimmune mechanisms for the modulation of central nervous system sensitization? and of course, chronic pain. Well, in this paper, we discuss both animal studies on nutrition and pain, as well as human clinical studies. I don't have the time to go through all of that today on this episode. It would be for a really long, detailed episode, but I'm gonna talk about both. I'm gonna talk about animal studies first, very, very briefly. So based on animal studies, we know that the standard American diet, when animals, specifically um, mice or rats or fed, a standard American diet, it results in microglial activation of the central nervous system and pain. That is clearly seen in animal studies. We also know that inadequate or poor nutrition contributes to neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation is found in many chronic systemic conditions. And then finally, kind of the hot topic of the day, so to speak, is that metabolic ketosis in these murine studies or in the studies of mice favorably impacts both oxidative stress and neuronal excitability. So I'll say that one more time. Ketogenic diets in mice and rats have been found to positively alter metabolic ketosis in a way that impacts oxidative stress and neuronal excitability. And I'll tell you right now, we don't have enough human studies with regard to the impact of a ketogenic diet or uh, ketogenic nutrition on various types of chronic diseases. Specifically, we need more with regard to nutrition and chronic pain, but there's definitely good animal models for this with regard to chronic pain. Now, in this paper, there's an entire page that goes through various animal studies and the impact of nutrition on pain in animals. And I'd like to say that many people, shall we say, poo-poo animal studies as not being useful. However, I would argue and say that a really good animal study can set the groundwork for a really good randomized control trial that is being done later on on humans. So look at the animal studies, um, take the information that's there, 
of course, it's not a randomized controlled clinical trial on humans, but know that it might set the foundation for later on. But based on human studies on nutrition, as I mentioned before, we have the highest level of evidence, level 1A, that an altered dietary pattern and altered specific nutrients promote analgesia. We also have level 5 evidence that this analgesia may result from the modulation of central nervous system sensitization, specifically the microglia, which we'll go into as we go through this uh, episode today. I want to go through some of the studies that we reviewed and covered in this paper and explain what the study was about and how you can apply this to clinical practice. And if you're watching this slide presentation, what I'm going to do is in the upper left-hand corner, I'm gonna put the level of evidence that this particular study is valued at, so to speak. So you can see, okay, how much can we rely or maybe not rely on this study? Or do we need more information with regard to this particular topic? So the first one, is a study 2016 from the Journal of Neuroinflammation. The title of that paper is Targeting Inflammation as a Treatment Modality for Neuropathic Pain in Spinal Cord Injury, a Randomized Controlled Trial. So this randomized controlled trial, the reason why it's level evidence for, usually RCTs are kind of higher up um, in the two or one area. The reason why, this was a very small group. So even though they randomized two different groups, uh, the one group that they were, uh, had the, the research trial was done on was only about 20 participants. So ideally, if this was maybe 100 participants, the level of evidence probably would have been greater. But still, there was a control group with this, so it fits into an RCT. This was a 12-week anti-inflammatory diet intervention for people who had neuropathic pain. And they looked at outcomes of inflammation both, uh, uh, both pro as well as anti-inflammatory cytokines, as well as looking at pain scores and specifically neuropathic pain scores for this population. Now, what's really nice about this paper, and not every study, most studies don't do this uh, in such detail, they gave really detailed information about what the anti-inflammatory diet intervention consisted of. So this anti-inflammatory diet intervention in this study focused on the elimination of common food intolerances and inflammation-inducing foods, as well as the introduction of foods and supplements that were anti-inflammatory. So examples of foods that were removed from the diet included those that were high glycemic, so that includes products that are high in added sugar, as well as products such as wheat. They took out cow's milk from this as well, and they took out, or they made sure they took out hydrogenated oils. So many of the seed oils that fall into that omega-6 category that cause inflammation. Now with that, participants also consumed dietary supplements with established anti-inflammatory benefits. So what were these supplements? Omega-3 fatty acids, both EPA and DHA, at a dose of about three per day. So they dosed about 1,000 milligrams of both EPA and um, uh, DHA three times per day. They also took antioxidants in, in pill form, specifically coenzyme Q10, and acetylcysteine, which has both anti-inflammatory as well as antioxidant and uh, detoxification properties, um, mixed tocopherols, which is vitamin E, alpha lipoic acid, extracts of green tea, zinc and selenium, which have been shown to have an effect on pain and muscle relaxation. And then finally, curcumin was taken in pill form, about 1,200 milligrams. So they took out uh, inflammatory foods, obviously put in anti-inflammatory foods, and as well, they included anti-inflammatory dietary supplements as part of this intervention. And if we go back to the conclusion of that study, you'll see there down at the bottom of that slide that overall the results of this study demonstrate the efficacy of targeting inflammation as a means of treating chronic neuropathic pain with the potential mechanisms or with the potential to impact the mechanisms with regard to pro-inflammatory cytokines, specifically PGE2, so it's prostaglandin E2. The next study we'll take a look at 2020 from the Journal of Pain Medicine, evidence level of four. The title of this paper is Dietary Inflammatory Index Scores Are Associated with Pressure Point Pain Hypersensitivity in Women with Fibromyalgia. Now, the reason why this is level four is because there wasn't necessarily a, a, an intervention in this, in this study. They're just looking at the association between a inflammatory dietary index and pain pressure hypersensitivity in women with fibromyalgia. But there were two different uh, groups in this study. One, the first group 
or women diagnosed with fibromyalgia. The second group were menopause matched controls. So there were two groups, but there wasn't necessary intervention. But they did find that the group that had a higher dietary inflammatory index score associated or was correlated with tender points for in the women who had fibromyalgia. And they also looked at disease, disease severity, fatigue, sleep anxiety, and central sensitization. The next study, again, recent paper, 2020 from the Journal of Pain Medicine, much, much higher on the evidence level. This is evidence level 2B. They looked at a 12-week, or they compared a 12-week low-carbohydrate diet to a low-fat diet on pain in individuals with knee osteoarthritis. So if you're a low-carb advocate, you're really going to enjoy this paper because at the end of this 12-week period, they found that oxidative stress is related, or lowering oxidative stress is related to functional improvements in pain in the group with a lower carbohydrate diet, not necessarily the low fat diet. So if you're looking at evidence with regard to a low carbohydrate diet, with regard to pain specifically in individuals with knee osteoarthritis, this is really good and really high quality evidence that a low carbohydrate diet can help people with knee osteoarthritis and pain specifically with regard to reducing oxidative stress. Now, along the lines of the same topic, looking at nutritional interventions for knee osteoarthritis, this is, this is an older paper from 2013, but higher level of evidence, evidence level 1B, the effects of intensive diet and exercise on knee joint loads, inflammation, and clinical outcomes among overweight and obese adults with knee osteoarthritis. This is a longer study. This study was 18 months. So we're looking at a you know, really deep, intense study for the individuals here. But the conclusion from this study was that among those who are overweight and they have knee osteoarthritis, after 18 months, participants in the diet and exercise group, as well as the diet group, had more weight loss and greater reductions in interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory uh, cytokine, than the exercise group alone. And this study also showed that those in the diet group had greater reductions in knee compressive forces than those in the exercise group alone. So it goes to show you that combining diet and exercise is the way to go to help people with both inflammation as well as their weight, specifically with regard to osteoarthritis. There's some other studies that show this as well, but we have really high evidence just kind of looking at the expert opinion from, uh, from this particular study that combining diet and exercise is effective for chronic knee osteoarthritis. And again, just to build out this topic a little bit more, there's this paper, 2018, from the Journal of Arthritis and Rheumatology. The title of this paper is Diet-Induced Weight Loss Alone or Combined with Exercise in Overweight or Obese People with Knee Pain. This is a systematic review of meta-analysis. This is evidence 1A, so really the top of the pyramid with regard to confidence and expert opinion here, that when you combine exercise with nutrition, it has an impact on weight as well as pain scores with regard to osteoarthritis. What's important about this paper is that the experts report moderate pain relief. That's really important. Most studies, when you look at single interventions like just exercise or just diet or just CBT has small impacts on pain. This combination is moderate impacts with regard to pain, and most of the studies show with regard to functional activity as well. This systematic review and meta-analysis specifically mentioned that the effects on inflammatory biomarkers are questionable. Now, that doesn't really surprise me because biomarkers are really kind of like a snapshot in time, and different people, depending where they are along the course of their, the obesity range, and many of these patients who are obese also have prediabetes or diabetes. So it doesn't surprise me that we may or may not be able to rely or uh, with, with a lot of confidence say that it has an impact on biomarkers. I would question that. I would say, let's kind of look at this a little bit closer because if you look at patients and you place them on uh, both diet as well as exercise interventions, you will see biomarkers change over the weeks. So we've talked a lot about knee osteoarthritis. This is from the Journal of Spine, 2011. This was a pilot study. That's why it only received a level evidence of four. But this was a multidisciplinary, medically supervised, 
non-surgical weight loss program for low back pain. This was a 52-week intervention. So obviously, these people received a lot of care over the course of a year. Most insurance companies, at least in the United States of America, do not cover that type of care. So we need to take that just into consideration. But they found at the end of this 52-week trial period that non-surgical weight loss in obese patients with low back pain both improve pain as well as function. So we've talked a lot about diet so far. We've talked a lot about weight loss and looking at pain and looking at inflammatory markers. We talked about oxidative stress. We talked about neuroinflammation. I want to turn your attention to this paper in the Journal of Nutrition. This is from 2017. It's an evidence level of 2B. It looks at the tolerance and efficacy of a polyamine deficient diet for the treatment of perioperative pain. So polyamines occur naturally in many types of foods. Our body actually needs, needs polyamines, although there's no uh, nutritional requirement for them. But polyamines can be very high in both red meat as well as processed foods. So if you have someone who has a very high uh, amount of meat in their diet, or of course, high amount of processed foods, which the average American has upwards of 60% of their diet is high in processed foods, bringing that amount of polyamine down or, or and in fact, having a polyamine deficient diet does help with the treatment of pain. This study particularly looked at perioperative pain. Now, why does it help? Well, there's been some research that shows that polyamines have an effect on toll-like receptors. So it has an effect on modulating those toll-like receptors, which in turn modulates the immune system and modulates that microglia and finally that central sensitization this level of evidence of 2B, the conclusion from this study was that suppression of polyamines from the diet offers a nutrition-based treatment option for perioperative pain reduction independent of and complementary to typical analgesic properties. So in essence, um, this study, they actually gave them a polyamine deficient drink. That was pretty much all they, they uh, took in with regard to their diet. Most people aren't going to tolerate that. But it does show you that if you decrease polyamines in the diet, it may have an impact on analgesia. Now, in addition to polyamines in the diet, we also want to look at glutamate specifically. So glutamate is common in many packaged products. It's common in many processed food. Um, monosodium glutamate or variations of monosodium glutamate are added to foods to improve their taste. This study from the Journal of Current Developments of Nutrition this is from June of 2020, very recent. It looked at chronic pain in Gulf War veterans. This was a randomized controlled uh, trial, evidence level 2B, looked at the effect of a low glutamate diet and how it can impact pain and other symptoms in veterans with Gulf War illness. And they found that a low glutamate diet was effective for the treatment of chronic pain and many other symptoms associated with Gulf War illness. So if you're looking at different types of food additives, or specific um, elements of the diet, low glutamate and low polyamine diets will have an impact according to the highest level of evidence and uh, expert opinion for the impact of chronic pain. So again, I'm gonna pop in here with this summary slide looking at how nutrition can be used as a target for central sensitization. Obviously papers like this can both inform dietary or nutrition approaches, but when we're talking about things on a kind of cellular level, it can also be used to develop um, new pharmaceutical interventions. Of course, if you know me, I hope we can kind of keep dialing in the diet and nutrition and lifestyle to help people rather than um, pharmaceutical interventions. There's a place for that, of course, but what's nice about lifestyle interventions is that they have very few negative side effects and oftentimes have the most powerful positive um, effects on people's health. So just looking kind of at this slide on the left-hand side, there are seven potential therapeutic targets with regard to nutrition the neuroimmune mechanisms and central sensitization. Those are impacting oxidative stress, impacting toll-like receptors, impacting, impacting afral vagal, uh, vagal nerves, the microglia, the gut microbiome, polyamines and glutamate, and then finally neurotransmitters, specifically because glutamate has an impact on the uh, glutamate balance in the nervous system. And there's this slide, again, I'll turn it, uh, your attention to this one again if you're listening to this in the car or you're exercising go on home and take a look at this presentation because it'll show you how exercise 
impacts the gut microbiome, specifically increases the diversity of the gut microbiome. So when you combine exercise with a low sugar diet, so obviously we don't want to have a lot of added sugar to the diet, a diet that's low in saturated fat from seed oils. When you combine those two, it has an impact on gut microbiome, has an impact on the vagus nerve, it has an impact on inflammation. And of course, all that can normalize glial cell activity in the central nervous system and hopefully modulate or decrease central nervous system sensitization. With regard to diet, we're looking at an anti-inflammatory diet that is high in antioxidants, has the ability to decrease oxidative stress, and has the ability to modulate or prevent uh, the activation of toll-like receptors in both the peripheral and the central nervous system to decrease that central sensitization. Now, we talked a lot today about diet interventions and how to help people with dietary interventions and how they have an effect on chronic pain. Also, in this paper, we looked at how to deliver these interventions. So this paper here from 2018 called The Effectiveness of Telephone-Based Interventions for Managing Osteoarthritis and Spinal Pain. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis, evidence level 1B. From this evidence, they concluded that they are moderately confident that telephone-based interventions can reduce pain intensity as well as disability in patients with osteoarthritis and spinal pain compared to usual care, which is good information for us right now, especially during COVID, when many of us are still relying on or have increased the amount of remote-based um, counseling or interventions for the management of chronic pain. And then there's this article from 2017 called Lifestyle Interventions Based on the Diabetes Prevention Program Delivery via eHealth. Again, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis. This is evidence level 1A that showed that eHealth apps or eHealth interventions are promising and can have an impact on diabetes for people, but, that, but when you combine these eHealth e -health interventions with some counseling, so when you combine, let's say, 10 weeks of an eHealth intervention but you also give maybe one or two counseling interventions that are live that is potentially more effective for these types of chronic diseases that we see. So again, here is your reference if you want to reference everything I spoke about on today's episode. Of course, I encourage you to look at this paper, Nutritional Interventions in Chronic Pain, an Innovative Way of Targeting Central Nervous System Sensitization. In June 2020, Expert Opinion on Therapeutic Targets, the journal of expert opinion on therapeutic targets. Again, this has been a listen, learn, and earn episode. So you can earn two CEs slash CEUs by logging on to the Integrated Pain Science Institute. Once you get to the homepage, you're going to scroll over to the courses tab, scroll down to listen and learn, and click on the episode to register episode number 200, where you can learn further about nutrition, central sensitization, and chronic pain. Okay, it's been great spending this time with you this week. Stay tuned. I've got lots of things planned as we head into late 2020 and as we change gears and shift into 2021. Lots of great things planned. I know it's been kind of a rough year for some people, but 2021 is going to look good for people living with chronic pain as we help them overcome chronic pain naturally with all the various interventions we've been talking about. I'm Dr. Joe Tad. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit IntegrativePainScienceInstitute.com. That's IntegrativePainScienceInstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.